Welcome to our webinar today. And it just so happens today is the last day of uh, Women's History Month. And we are very proud to have an all women uh, cast of panelists. Uh, not, not Paul though, but thank you for joining us, Paul. <laughs> um, again, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today for the sixth uh, webinar in the cruise series, highlighting our neighborhoods and merchants across the city. So let's get started. Uh, my name is Vas Kineris, and I am a small business advocate. As an immigrant, I'm all too familiar with the challenges and successes of running a small business. Um, I actually grew up in my, my family's uh, grocery stores in the Mission and the Excelsior. And um, that's where I really learned the true meaning of small business and how small business uh, fits into our, the fabric of our community. Um, many times my father would give uh, credit to our customers because they couldn't afford to buy the groceries that they needed. And um, so many valuable lessons to be learned from small business. Um, I also had a small business for 25 years in the Fillmore. I had a high-end furniture design store and I closed it happily about five years ago to focus on the small business advocacy work that I do. Um, I am now the co-founder of Next SF. It's a agency and a think tank that creates private public partnerships to promote small business and the neighborhood corridors of San Francisco. I like to start by saying uh, small business is big business. There are 90,000 businesses in San Francisco. Half of them are considered small business. That means they employ 10 or less employees. However, these businesses employ 350,000 people in San Francisco. That's more than a third of the population of San Francisco. So this is huge. Our small businesses have a huge impact on the vitality, the culture of San Francisco. Um, and then finally, just remember, if we change our buying by just 1% to local businesses, that creates um, $100 million back to the local economy. So today I'd like to welcome you to our District 9 Community Forum, which has been sponsored by Cruz. Thank you very much. In this event, we are presenting the commercial corridors of District 9 in San Francisco. This actually happens to be the largest district in San Francisco. The boundaries are from 13th Street on the north to Manzel on the south, and from Potrero to the east and Valencia to the west. Um, these include the merchant corridors within this district include Bernal Heights, Mission Bernal, Portola, the Mission, and the Northeast Mission neighborhood as well. Each merchant and community leader will tell their neighborhood's story and give you an update on how their businesses and corridors are adapting during this crisis. As we slowly turn the corner during this difficult time, merchants need more exposure to one another, the community and our private public partners. As we all know, business, small business are more than just places of commerce. They are the neighborhoods to our communities and culture. But first, a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded. So if you miss something or wanna share it, uh, we'll have it up on our website or we, and we will share it with you in the follow-up email from us. So it's been over a year now that we've been in the Zoom world and I'm sure uh, we're all proficient on these platforms. So throughout the webinar, please drop your question in the Q&A section and we can share with the panelists um, at the end. And we also encourage everyone to tweet and repost our forum and use the hashtags from the organizations represented on this webinar today. So let's start the program. I'm very proud to present uh, Kenny Montilla, Public Affairs Manager at Cruise. And we are living uh, in uncertain times, but they're also exciting times. Cruise, the future is now. Very exciting. San Francisco is the first major US city to have um, autonomous cars on the road. Um, as the cars are slowly introduced to the city, there are many benefits which are available to our merchants, customers, and employees. Um, as we know, historically, moments of crisis create many innovation opportunities. And now is the time to engage with our private and public uh, partners to create new collaborations and work on solutions. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kenny to the stage. Welcome, my friend. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Voss, and thank you everyone else for being here, panelists included, um, for agreeing to be a part of this uh, important conversation. Um, with that, let me try to share my screen here real fast. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so a uh, quick introduction to myself, like Voss mentioned, my name is Kenny Montilla. I'm the public affairs manager at Cruise. Um, and you know, my role is pretty focused on just engaging with the community and having conversations um, to introduce Cruz, who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it, but also to get your feedback and understanding um, as to how we can build a product that best serves the community. Um, and specifically the small business community holds a, a near and dear spot in my heart because similarly to Voss, I also grew up um, in a grocery store. My dad's a local business owner uh, back in New York where I'm from. Um, so I, I know a little bit about what you all uh, work on. Um, and I just know the entrepreneurial spirit that you all carry. Um, but with that, let's get right into the program here. Um, let's see. So I want to start just by giving a quick background on, you know, sort of who we are. For those that don't already know, Cruise is a self-driving car company. We're building an autonomous vehicle that would safely connect people to the places, things, and experiences they care about. Um, and one of the things that I find most interesting as I have these conversations with folks is uh, there's this idea almost that autonomous vehicles uh, are this new thing. And to an extent, they are, right? I think the biggest difference is that today they're just realer than ever before. Um, we've seen autonomous technology sort of come into play via self-parking features and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, although it's a, a technology that's been worked on since the 80s, now we're seeing them on our roads today, um, which is the biggest difference. And I also think it's important to sort of think about like, why is this important? And there's a few reasons. Um, number one, Safety is at the core of everything that we do. Um, but more importantly, when we think about, uh, we've seen Governor Newsom's proposal to phase out gas powered vehicles. And the reason for that uh, is because of the greenhouse gas emissions emitted by traditional gas powered vehicles. Cruise vehicles are all electric. So we serve an environmental benefit. Um, again, the self-driving feature, there's over 6 million Americans with uh, disabilities who identify transportation as a major barrier to access, which affects their employment opportunities, which in turn directly impacts you all. Um, and also it, it, it impacts the businesses that folks frequent. So these are important things to care about. Um, and again, keep in mind that our idea is to create a shared fleet um, with the idea being, if we can get more folks to transition away from the single occupancy vehicle and use more shared mobility, we can get cars off the road, which again, just helps support this vision of um, more sustainable transportation. Um, and again, like I just highlighted the, the safety challenges, right? There are over 36,000 road fatalities every year in the United States. Um, last year throughout the pandemic, although there were fewer vehicle miles traveled, there was still a rise in the number of road fatalities. Um, so it's clear that something isn't working. The, the biggest issue is that, you know, we've sort of come to accept this as the norm, right? Um, it's, and at Cruz, we believe in challenging the status quo. So we don't accept that as the norm. You know, I mentioned the, the Americans with disabilities and the, the barrier to transportation. Um, you know, if, if you don't need a driver's license to drive the car, if you don't need to, you know, drive the car on your own, uh, this is another alternative for you to be able to use. And again, the, the US emissions that are just, that come from transportation make it the largest single contributor to carbon pollution. So by leveraging an all, an all electric fleet, we believe we can help push these uh, issues in the right direction. Um, and a few of the ways that we have been doing that uh, are, we recently announced the Clean Mile Challenge, which is basically calling on our peers in the autonomous vehicle industry to also commit to using all electric vehicles. Um, and part of the reason for that is, again, this is such a new industry that there really is no reason or shouldn't be a reason why um, folks can't commit to going all electric today. Um, again, we understand and appreciate the steps that we're taking to phase out gas powered vehicles, but if there are actions that can be taken today to help support California, San Francisco, and really the country's uh, sustainability goals, we believe we should make the effort to do that um, and not just rely on government to do that. Private companies need to step up and do our part as well. Um, 
in addition to that, we recently announced our intention to build uh, one of the largest electric vehicle charging facilities right here in our hometown of San Francisco. Um, and aside from serving as a charging facility, it's where we'll continue our research and development um, and just continue our fleet maintenance. And you know, this is important, again, thinking through, if we're gonna phase out gas powered vehicles, it's important to keep in mind two things. Number one, not everyone can afford an electric vehicle. So how can we leverage um, these companies that are working on autonomous technology or any sort of ride hail technology um, and, and encourage them to make the investments needed to be able to scale a fleet which would in turn allow for the general public to have more access um, and be able to use uh, these green miles. Um, so with that, uh, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation here, my focus has been on engaging with people, um, whether that's neighborhood groups, merchant associations like yourselves, or just some of our partners in the community. Um, you know, our focus is on getting this right in San Francisco. We're big on launching with cities and not at cities. Um, and it, again, with that, it's important to keep in mind that we are pre-commercial. We don't have a product that's actually out there at the moment, which is why I think it's so important to have these conversations now so that we can talk about it now from the onset, as opposed to launching something and then trying to retrofit, um, you know, to account for whatever recommendations the public may have. Um, you know, the way we think about everything is, like I mentioned, how would this benefit our city? Um, and the best way to do that is by engaging with the folks directly and getting an understanding for what the community's needs are. Um, and one of the ways we did that over this past year was with our Stand With SF partnership. Some of you may be familiar um, with this, but in short, what happened was, you know, at the onset of the pandemic, um, one of the biggest uh, sort of indicators of the severity of the pandemic was the rise in food insecurity. You know, uh, a few weeks into shelter in place, we really had no plans of offering a delivery service, but there was just this opportunity to say, hey, this is something the community could use, so why not step up? Um, so we spoke to our partners at the SF Marin Food Bank and SF New Deal, um, and they essentially said we have to scale, um, you know, our operation from serving hundreds to more than 10,000 or thousands of people overnight. Um, so we're like, well, we have this fleet of vehicles, maybe we could work together to get this done. Um, and to date, we've delivered several hundred thousand of contact deliveries of meals and bags of groceries to vulnerable communities across San Francisco. Um, I believe the number is somewhere over 84% of the deliveries we've made have gone to uh, households below the San Francisco poverty line. Um, so that's just to you know show the impact that this can have. Um, but more importantly, to show the impact that it can have when you work with partners in the city that are already working on some of these very important um, efforts. Um, but I don't wanna tell the story myself, so I'll share this quick video for you all to see um, a little more about that impact. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, with all of the challenges that folks were facing, food insecurity was one of the greatest ones. And this is most seen at SF Marin Food Bank. And they went from delivering hundreds of meals a day to needing to deliver thousands of meals a day. Um, we shut down the restaurant at the end of March and I had to lay off my entire team. SF New Deal came along around like a month and a half after the shelter in place order. And so our goal is to sort of help keep people afloat for long enough and just like hang on until, until the economy recovers. Well, we got called back and now we're delivering meals to those most vulnerable. Um, low income, people who can't leave their house, the elderly. Within a week, um, we had a couple dozen restaurants on board and we went from doing a thousand meals the first week to 19,000 meals the second week. It was amazing because for me to come across this organization that was addressing food insecurity, at the same time, I would be able to rehire back my team. So it felt like a win-win situation. We've had a tremendous impact with our Stand With SF program. To date, we've delivered over 100,000 meals and groceries to those most in need. So I know the number cited there was 100,000, but this video is a few months old, so it's a bit more today. Um, but with that, I, I wanna get into a little bit about the technology, how it works, and really how we're building a safe driver. Um, I think one of the important things to keep in mind is this vehicle comes equipped with over 40 sensors that are 
camera, radar, and LIDAR. Each one serves a different function, as you can sort of see in the graphics here. Um, the cameras uh, are able to paint the picture around the AV of you know, what it's seeing in real time. Um, and the LIDAR sensors help detect objects within close proximity to the vehicle. The radar helps determine you know, the speed and velocity of any approaching objects. So it has a more long-term range. And when you put that all together, um, it, it allows for the vehicle to have 360 degree vision. I'm yet to meet a human being that has 360 degree vision. So it's just an added layer of safety that's being built into these vehicles from the beginning. And then as far as our testing is concerned, um, like I mentioned, safety is our North Star. Um, and through a few different approaches, we're able to test our vehicles 24 seven. Um, you may see our vehicles today um, in the real world, although if you see them today, it's through that delivery service, as I mentioned. Um, and also recently in late December, I wanna say it was, or late November, we received our driverless testing permit from the California DMV. So we have begun driverless testing in certain parts of San Francisco. Um, and then we have our close course track where we do uh, some testing as well as VR simulation where we replicate um, an exact map of San Francisco um, and test our vehicles through that, which allows us to also put it through any and every scenario that you can think of that a San Francisco driver might come across on our roads. Um, in addition to that, we're in constant communication with first responders as well as just road safety advocates to understand um, you know, how we should think about safety. Again, we don't pretend to be the experts on everything. We know what we know, but we also know what we don't know. So how can we work with folks that are you know, industry experts to really understand how we can build a product that again, really accounts for all of these different uh, buckets that we care about. And so recently you might've seen that we joined Vision Zero um, and support their mission to end all traffic deaths um, and signed on to the letter encouraging President Biden to commit to a zero traffic deaths goal nationwide. Um, so again, we are trying to be proactive on these, set of, on these different issues, um, as well as working with groups like Mothers Against Drug Driving to understand, you know, again, how can we just help improve the quality of safety on our roads today? Um, and I touched on this a little bit already, but a couple of the ways you may encounter our vehicles today are through, normally it would be just through our normal autonomous vehicle testing. Um, currently it's through the food delivery program or like I mentioned through our driverless testing. And another thing that I wanna highlight is that uh, it's not like we just began driverless testing overnight. We've been testing on San Francisco roads for over five years. Um, there's been over 2 million autonomous miles logged um, you know, before we even started any sort of driverless testing. And again, we're doing it very incrementally. Um, so uh, you know, we are being, um, very thoughtful as to how we do it um, and making sure that we engage with our, our friends at different neighborhood associations, et cetera, et cetera, as well as um, local officials to let them know like, hey, we're gonna begin testing in such and such area, uh, which is again, just to create a, a level of transparency and make sure that folks know what we're working on. Um, and luckily now that you know me, you have someone you can reach out to if you have any questions about it. Um, and I wanna share this quick video of our first driverless moment uh, in the sunset. Well, I can't wait. This is in the sunset. There's, there's a lot of great stuff in the sunset to go to. You can go and get dumplings. I can't wait to take that first driverless ride when, when I can get in the back. The first dumpling run, like yeah. dumpling zero? Yeah, I'll go pick up dumplings for everybody. That's a lot of dumplings. So that was just a, a quick moment shared by um, two of our founders here at Cruise. Uh, from that first driverless moment, which was uh, Pretty well, major accomplishment. Um, and then last but not least, I wanted to share just a, a sort of glimpse into the future, as Voss would probably put it, um, with our big project, which is the Cruise Origin. We announced this project uh, last January, um, which is just, like I mentioned, our goal has been and remains to build a shared ride product. Um, and this is just a quick view into that. So with that, here's the Cruise Origin. What we're showing you today is what you'd build if there were no cars. Meet the Cruise Origin. It is self-driven. It is all electric. It is shared. It is not a concept. It is a production vehicle. I've got a ridiculous amount of space here. You can touch your toes, you can stretch. Awesome and affordable. It's right for you. Electric and shared. And that's what's right for the world.
And with that, I think I'm way over time. Sorry about that, Voss. But uh, there is one alias you could always reach us at. It's community at getcruise.com. Um, and I'll share my email for everyone. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to follow up. Um, so with that, thank you so much. And Voss, I'll toss it back over to you. Kenny, I just want to say I've seen that video dozens of times. And I get goosebumps each time. I'm not kidding. I can't wait to try that driverless car. Um, I just want to thank us. Cruz again. I, we're not here to promote Cruz in any way, but I just want to thank Cruz. You guys are really setting the gold standard for community engagement. And I know you've reached out to many of our merchant association members around the city. And I just wish more of our private partners were as understood the community of San Francisco, the way you guys are doing it, and also the way you're demonstrating it. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, but let's continue with the program because we got a lot of good stuff to share. So um, before we begin our program, uh, we have a very short video montage of some of the neighborhood corridors of District 9. So take it away, Dominic. I love it. So that should whet your appetite to go visit these corridors. I, it's such a privilege for me to do these webinars and visit these different districts around the city because neighborhoods are the gems of San Francisco. Neighborhoods are where you see the heart and soul of the city. And District 9 is truly an amazing place. There's manufacturing, there's mom and pop businesses, there's immigrant owned small businesses, there's high end restaurants. You can find everything there. And honestly, it's it's big, but you can walk from one district to the other. You can take different modes of mobility. You can drive, you can do anything. The bus service is great. So, um, and pretty soon we'll have crews, right? So that'll be even better. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you. Um, so now let's meet our panelists. First panelist is uh, Lori Keynes. Uh, she is a, the small business owner of 12 Small Things on Cortland Ave and the co-chair of the Bernal Business Alliance. Welcome, Lori. Great, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yes, I'm Lori Keynes with the Bernal Business Alliance. Um, our Bernal Heights neighborhood stretches from San Jose Avenue on the west to Cesar Chavez on the north, Highway 101 to the east, and 280 to the south. And I've lived in Bernal uh, for over 30 years now. We came just at the time of the 1989 earthquake. And uh, our house got a little bit of a jolt, but our whole neighborhood was pretty, pretty safe because it's built on rock. And that really is like the highlight of our neighborhood. You can go up to the top of Bernal Heights and see all around the city. It's just such a marvelous view. So especially with this weather right now, if any of you haven't been up there recently, take another walk. It's just been redone by the, the city now. So there's good trails and it's, it's a wonderful view. Um, 
But about five years ago, I saw an office space open up in the Bernal Heights Neighborhood Center, which has been a community anchor for our neighborhood on Cortland here. They've done such great outreach during the pandemic, but they had a little office space to share with a storefront. And I'd been working out of my house for so many years with my business, which is really to promote fair trade, handmade artisan goods made by small rural communities around the world that need our support. So I've been doing that online and out of my house. And then I had this chance to have a little storefront in front of the office space. So I've been here for five years now. It's, it's such a great community. In addition to the neighborhood center, we have this beautiful renovated library across the street from me. And then on one side of Cortland, we have just such marvelous restaurants um, stretching all the way to Mission and then down to Bayshore, Italian, Asian, Peruvian, Mexican. It's just a great diversity of tastes. We have a gym, we have an art gallery, we have beautiful florist shops. So it's, it's before the pandemic, it was just a really robust community with a lot of foot traffic. But we did notice um, even before the pandemic, the slowdown of shopping, small business, especially with Amazon competition, other big box real, you know, realtors, they were you know, siphoning off a lot of our business um, by delivering things to people's homes. So that was challenging. And we did lose a couple of businesses even before the pandemic. But then once, once that hit and we all had to close down, it, it was a ghost town. It was definitely a ghost town. Um, we've been able to keep in touch though, the, those of us left here, which is, is the majority, but through technology. I mean, these Zoom meetings, we've been emailing each other, um, Hillary Ronan's office with Amy Bennett, she's been so great about letting us know about PPP opportunities for loans and grants. Um, you know, we've really taken advantage of staying in really close touch through technology. And that's been wonderful. Some of our businesses have done their own GoFundMe to um, pay for parklets when they couldn't have customers eating inside. So we now have a lot of parklets. Those come with a lot of challenges as well. And again, we've been able to stay in touch and just try to work through any issues that our neighborhoods had with parking versus food service. Um, a lot of people have expanded their websites so people can order online, but it, this we still need a lot of love and, and we're actually looking into a, a fund like a rainy day fund for our merchants. So I don't know about probably, I think all neighborhoods have had a lot of petty theft recently too with, with people just desperate and needing whatever cash they can find. So we, we wanna create this fund that merchants can use for unexpected expenses, like repairing graffiti or break-ins, um, things that come up that you just haven't budgeted for. So, so you know, we're, it's been a very, it's been a hard experience, but it's also been a good one of getting to know your neighbor and trying to help more during this time. We're also trying to get a group, we have such, fabulous artists here in Bernal Heights. We're trying to get some artwork to be able to be hung in um, storefronts that are still shut down and, and in need of renting. So between that and some murals that we have some grants to be, have murals painted on some buildings, we're hoping to bring the arts to these empty spaces for now. And we're even planning a sort of outdoor get together probably in the summer, you know, once more vaccinations happen. And, and we can be outside and use the parklets and just have our community come together in a safe way outdoors. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, so thank you for letting me introduce ourselves. Appreciate it. And when I was there on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, people were sitting outside, sipping wine and the street, honestly, it looks so alive, so inviting. Yeah. And um, I've known that street for many, many years. <laughs> Yeah. And it's really, um, it's, it's yet another neighborhood that's going through a renaissance. Yeah. And I think it's just going to get better and better. Thank you so much. So Great. next person, my friend, Gwen Kaplan. Um, she is an amazing woman. She is a legacy small business advocate. She's also the owner of uh, Ace Mailing. Um, and she's a longtime board member of the Northeast Mission Business Association. Um, again, another Wonder Woman. Please welcome and tell us a little bit about what, what's happening in your neighborhood. 
Well, thank you, Voss, very much. Um, yes, I am Gwen Kaplan. My business is Ace Mailing. We're a direct marketing company on 16th Street between Folsom and Harrison. Uh, we're a third generation San Francisco business and um, we moved to the mission uh, in 1983 and to 16th Street uh, in 1986. So we uh, love the mission and everything about it. Um, one of the things you can say about the mission is that uh, when um, the mission was founded, um, those men and women could have the choice of any place in San Francisco because there wasn't very hardly any people here and they did choose the mission. So uh, that says a lot for our beauty, for our weather, for everything uh, that we love about San Francisco and the mission. Um, I founded the Northeast Mission Business Association uh, in 1990 and we formed it as a um, response to wanting to get the business community together. Our boundaries are from uh, Potrero to Cap, from Cap to uh, from Potrero to Cap and from 22nd um, to 13th Division or the Central Freeway. So we encompass, as Voss was saying, warehouses, manufacturers, we have the SPCA, uh, we have Rainbow Grocery, Gus's Grocery, numerous restaurants, Asiento, we have spas, uh, we have businesses like mine that are warehouse businesses. So um, we are an extremely uh, varied and uh, diversified district. Uh, we have great relationships with all of our neighbor business organizations and um, just have really so enjoyed working with all of the different merchant, merchant groups. We, um, when we were founded, we worked on three things. And that was the first was to bound together to decrease criminal activity. The second one was to help with the homeless or unhoused population. And the third was work on, on access to capital. So um, the Council of District Merchants recently did a survey of uh, the members and merchant groups, and they had the same top three. <laughs> so the job doesn't cease. And I know Tracy is very active um, in the same group that I am with the Legislative Committee. And I have to say, uh, so we are, uh, um, as business people, I sometimes think that we are in a way like the Mars rover. We have to have, the Mars rover was uh, uh, persistence. So we're like Percy and we all enjoyed seeing that land and survive. So uh, that's kind of my motto for this year. Our business has never been closed. We are an open essential business service. So we have done all the things that are necessary to survive in this environment. And uh, our business is Ace mainly is okay. So anyway, and we've done everything we can to support the other businesses in our business area. So, and I just want to say that um, Cruise has been a part of our business organization and attended uh, when we were able to have in-person meetings, all of our in-person meetings. So um, I just wanna thank you for your community engagement. Normally we have met at Gus's Market in their conference room. So uh, we appreciate your engagement with us and telling us all about um, the wonderful things that Cruz has done in our area. And we do see you every day. So thank you and thank you, Voss. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your neighborhood. And by the way, this neighborhood is really special because um, it has many, many secret pockets that you need to discover. And um, it's really cool. You know, you, you can, there are unexpected uh, restaurants and amazing galleries and incredible um, innovative entrepreneurs. So, and then coincidentally, my mother was actually a garment worker in the factory right across the street from Ace Mailing back in the day. So right on 16th and uh, Harrison. So um, anyway, 
uh, District 9 is very special. Um, I actually have a question, if you don't mind, Gwen, from um, our friend, um, David Perry. His question is, um, he is a fan of the Gwen Kaplan Fan Club. And as a longtime business advocate, what are your top three issues as we head into the tenuous recovery and how best can the city assess those efforts? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. And I, um, I accept that compliment. I like it. <laughs> so anyway, Wonder Woman in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, that, that, that should be my motto. Um, well, I think that we are all dealing with the same three things I talked about, the criminal activity. We have a group that meets with uh, the small business uh, forum with the San Francisco Police Department once a month. And Tracy, you're there. And um, so I just want to say we are working very actively with them and, uh, um, on, and the city has supported us tremendously. So that, um, and we are working with all the unhoused groups that we can. The city is working hard on that. And the other thing that, uh, that we are doing is spreading the word on access to capital, PPP loans, the idols, uh, everything that we possibly can to help businesses. And um, um, there's a reason why our symbol for San Francisco is the phoenix, because we have risen and we are rising and we are coming back. So uh, thank you, David, and thank you for that nice question and the compliment. <laughs> awesome. Thank you again. So now I'd like to take, take it over to uh, Calle 24, my friend uh, Gabby Lozano. She's been involved with the Mission District for many, many years, and she's also the business liaison for Calle 24 and the Latino Cultural District as well. So welcome uh, to the stage, Gabby. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, gracias por invitarme. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Gaby Lozano. I am the business liaison with uh, Calle 24, the Latino Cultural District. A little bit of background about uh, the agency is that Calle 24 has been around for 25 years. Um, nowadays, it's known as the Latino Cultural District, and um, that happened through the entire sleep. Uh, tireless work of uh, about 19 people that put together that legislation and that happened about seven years ago. Now known as the Latino Cultural District and uh, <clears throat> very many things happen in, in, uh, within our district. I, it's uh, worth saying that um, the boundaries are Cisa Chavez to 22nd and um, Barlet to Potrero. Those are the boundaries as of now. Uh, I believe it's going to expand, um, but uh, that is just stay tuned. I don't know the new boundaries and I don't know how soon that'll happen or if it'll happen, but um, it's been in the works for about a year and a half now. Um, what happened? What, 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 what did the um, Latino Cultural District look like before the pandemic? what goes on before you know in the latino cultural district so i have to tell you something very interesting is that um uh the uh calle 24 what is the 24th street um commercial corridor pulls the most permits city permits for um, um festivities or what you call it festivals uh, out of the entire city. So you, you, you know by now that we like to party. And party is very, very important. We have all sorts, all sorts of um, gatherings here from Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, Carnaval, who doesn't know Carnaval. We have Fiestas de las Americas. We have uh, Las Posadas. We have the uh, Cesar Chavez. We have it all. Uh, the Low Road Riders, uh, Selena Knight, and you name it. If it's a party with music and good food, it's in the mission. It's on 24th Street. So <laughs> worth visiting, worth visiting. Never forget these words, worth visiting. Also, uh, something very important to say is that um, we are the largest um, art gallery in the nation. Why? Because you see uh, murals plastered all over and they change. 
year after year, they change according to the um, political climate or I don't know, but they change here and there and everywhere. So it's very important. It's important um, to, to continue the narrative of the culture, to continue the narrative of the new age, to continue very many things. It's important um, um, for cultural, uh, the cultural aspect of uh, the neighborhoods to continue the narrative. Um, so that was what it looked like, vibrant, and always, you know, plenty of people, businesses were packed, always, always. We have the taquerias that are open till 3 a.m. Not a, not a seat was available at the taquerias. Fast forward to 2020, now we have, we have lost about 17 businesses just within the LCD, which is the Latino Cultural District, uh, such times, so most of them were small, fragile businesses. The smaller the business is, the more fragile it is. I'm sure you all are um, acquainted with that circumstance. You know how it goes. So yes, um, most of the businesses nowadays are facing one difficulty after the other, trying to access funds and trying to you know, navigate or ride the wave, trying to you know, keep afloat. Um, so uh, businesses started shutting down in 2020 and wooden planks were um, taking the spaces of the entrances, the beautiful facades and all. So, you know, to make um, ends meet, um, the artists were left with no job and then we have all these wooden planks. So we put two and two together and decided, okay, how about we continue with uh, the narrative of uh, murals? And so we uh, gave this um, artist, street artist, a place for them to um, for them to continue their uh, craft, and they uh, were able to um, to do that. Now we have uh, more of everything, pretty wonderful and nice. Um, so that's a little bit what I can say about that. Uh, Calle 24, the Latino Cultural District, uh, faced very many uncertainties and trying to assist businesses. As, as I am the business liaison, I was trying to, um, you know, keep uh, everybody afloat and give them technical assistance of any sort of kind. Uh, and the uh, challenges arose from, from everywhere. The most difficult was for to see seniors that couldn't leave their homes because of the pandemic. Um, they were completely isolated from their families and access to uh, food was uh, scarce. So Calle 24 decided to join the other 27 agencies and to create the Latino, the Latino task force. And uh, we have a warehouse on um, 701 Alabama Street, where now we are feeding 9,000 people. No, I'm sorry, excuse me. It's 9,000 families a week. We are also a resource center. Uh, all these, you know, 27 agencies came together. And so some of them are for housing, some of them are for work placement, some of them there are for, you know, and we have it in different languages. It's not just for, um, Spanish speakers, but we have it in all languages. And uh, we not only service the mission area, but we service the entire city. So it is something that um, came out of uh, trying to meet the necessities of uh, the city. And so, so far uh, we are uh, coming out triumphant. Uh, we are also uh, testing, we have a testing site uh, on 24th and Mission, right outside the um, park station and we are vaccinating just across the street from our mm -hmm. office on CAP and 24th. So Thank we you. have become an essential part of um, the, um, the coming back of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. is taking a float of our businesses and the taking care of uh, the residents and especially the uh, seniors. So that's a brief mm -hmm. uh, introduction as, as to what we are Thank doing you. and Thank you. what it looks like now. Yeah. yeah, you're doing so much. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. You know, I'm glad you brought the, up the uh, the fact that there's so many murals. These murals, guys, are so important to the culture 
of the mission because they document visually the history and the people and the stories behind the mission. And um, I know whenever I travel to a new city, I always take a food and art tour of that city. And there are some amazing tours that you can take of the mission. And the tour guides will not only talk about the artwork, the history of the area, but also, um, you know, they'll take you into the restaurants and it, the mission really represents uh, pan Latino, you know, uh, not only Mexico, but Central America, South America, there's so much diversity among other cuisines too, of course. But um, our tagline here is, you know, uh, commerce is fleeting, right? Business come and go sometimes, but culture sticks. And that's, that's the thing to keep in mind because that's what brings us together. So thank you, Gabby. From now, from here, um, I'd like to take it to our friends, uh, Debbie Horn and Paul Miller. And they're the owners of the Royal Cuckoo Organ Piano Lounge. And they are super engaged members of the Mission Bernal Merchants Association. And one of my favorite spots in, in that area, I go there all the time. So take it away, guys. Hi, um, thank you for having us. It's really nice yeah. to be here. I'm Debbie Horn and this is my husband, Paul Miller. And we've both lived in the mission for about 30 years. We've worked in the service industry since we were very young. And so that's just what we've been doing forever. Um, we live within walking distance of both of our businesses, the Royal Cuckoo Organ Lounge and the Royal Cuckoo Market. And um, our family lives above us, more family lives next door to us. And they also all work at the bar. So it's um, definitely a family owned business, which I think has helped us during this, this COVID time as well. Um, we're about to have our 10 year anniversary. Yeah. yeah, it passed, but we're gonna celebrate it more and more and more. And, um, and also this place, the Royal Cuckoo Organ Lounge is open seven days a week, normally. Normally. And um, has jazz music, mm -hmm. live music, with the Hammond B3 organ built into the bar, great cocktails and never charges a cover charge. Sure. That's our thing. So we're definitely a neighborhood spot. Um, Paul knows more about the history of the specific bar, but it has a great history behind it. It's been a bar since- 1881. 1881. Nonstop, even so, during prohibition is a bar. So it's years. survived many mm -hmm. things, just like we're gonna survive this. Um, and then I would also say that we're, this Mission Bernal Strip that we're in is very, very special. I mean, it's the restaurants, the nightlife, the huge amount of diversity, the offbeat charm. Um, Paul yeah. had a really good point about- Well, a lot of the businesses here, you know, we, I mean, we're, we're no strangers to this neighborhood even before we owned a business, but uh, the businesses are, old school mom pops a lot of immigrant owned businesses but then also a lot of service industry people like ourselves who wanted to make their first jump into owning a business they're out here they, 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 if they're a, if you're a cook you open the restaurant if you're a bartender you open a bar if you're um uh you know whatever you, you know you are a waitress whatever all these businesses out here are owned and operated by people that that's what they did and it, that's keeps our and it keeps kind of a, a nice flavor out here um and it seems to be maintaining even, you know, even through the COVID. And uh, um, yeah, and then a lot of our, our, our customers too, are this, this is a real local, this is a real neighborhood where the, you know, the neighbors in Vernal and in the vicinity come out. This is where they, they go here. They really, they really love coming out here. Um, I know when we first opened, it was, that was our main clientele. But since then I've noticed that it, uh, uh, it's expanded more um, to other air, na further neighborhoods uh, in the Bay Area, and we're actually we're getting much many more uh, tourists or, or not now. Before <laughs> but, the pandemic. <laughs> but there, you know, it was built. It's like well, the hotel, the concierge were saying, "Hey, go out to this little strip. It's really cool. No one knows about. It. It's not in your book. Come out here." And uh, and that's you know, we've you know, the people want to come out to hear the music and, and try the food. It's a uh, yeah. so it's definitely getting more on the map. At the same time, keeping its real flavor of being like a very authentic uh, authentic place yeah like a typical night out on our wonderful little strip here would be um you know j live jazz music at the royal cuckoo with a great cocktail and then you could go right next door to like los panchos baklu blue plate milindo peru Thanks. emmy's front porch these are all yeah. right, right next to us you just walk next door whoever's 
available has a table yeah. and then you can go dancing or to a show at the knockout or el rio or the rock lucitas. bar lucitas yeah. has yeah. dancing old devil moon and then you can get late night food at los panchos till three sometimes four in the morning yeah. used to be yeah. cancun <laughs> still open super late um, yeah, so you go to have dinner at Blue ball. Plate, and then when you get hungry again after drinking, you head over to Wisconsin. Yeah, Panchos. lots of food. Yeah. Lots of food. And then, um, as we all know here during the COVID, it was a desolate ghost town. But in our little village right here, everyone became much tighter, checking in all the time, trying to open the same hours for safety and to get more people around us. Um, customers and regulars were super kind and sympathetic. Um, yeah, they, there was, up on us they would check on us. There's days that, I mean, like you say, we're family business. So Paul and I might just show up here and put two chairs in the door and just sell anything and say hi to people all day, you know, and just, just be here, just be here for people. Be open was the big thing. Um, it's been a slow reopening, but if I was going to mention a couple silver linings, the biggest one would be outdoor seating, shared spaces. We, we, that's like an economic lifeline. Um, now all the neighbors outside wave to each other across the street. Everyone wants to sit outside so they can just talk, talk, talk to everyone walking by. Um, we take care of the street now. We clean it. You know, it's like we're caretakers of outdoors now. Yeah, it's much safer out front. You know, And inclusive. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. The shared spaces is great. I mean, we believe strongly that streets are for people to pass by and have fun on it. And then the other super helpful thing for us is the jam permit, the music outdoors. Um, so these are things that we wanna continue doing for sure. And that, so some of these like forced changes um, are, you know, economic lifelines and super, super beneficial for the future so we can catch up on everything. Um, and then I would also mention like the future of Mission Bernal post pandemic, um, post COVID, um, I would say positive. Yeah. Everyone's feeling new energy just starting now. It's opening up. Things are yeah. getting a little bit busier. It's been a crazy year, but I think people are ready to safely come back and we can already feel it. People are calling. A lot of people think we've been closed um, until just now, but we, you know, we've been open all year at our other place and here every day that we could. So you know, we, it's a hustle and yeah. we just, we do it. And Everyone is hustling. <laughs> We've all been hustling it. It. and nobody wants to throw in the towel. Our whole life is food, live music and good drinks. That's what we do. And that's what we're going to do forever. Yeah. I love it. You guys yeah. are awesome ambassadors for Mission Bernal. Bravo. Thanks, Thanks for having <laughs> Thank us. Yeah, I mean, I want to say it's off the radar, but it's really not off the radar. I mean, everybody <laughs> loves that, that, that area. It's, it's so uh, charming and you guys are really like the lifeblood of the neighborhood. Thank you. So um, Thank you. I'd like to take it over to my friend, uh, Tracy Sylvester. She's an amazing, another amazing Wonder Woman. Um, she's also the proud owner of EHS Pilates, which is uh, an official um, San Francisco legacy business. So tell us about your yeah. neighborhood, Tracy, please. So hi, so um, thank you Voss and Cruz for hosting this wonderful neighborhood shout out webinar. Um, uh, my name is Tracy and I'm the owner of EHS Pilates. Um, we, I'm also on the board of the Mission Merchants Association, a member of the Valencia Corridor Association, the member of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and um, wrapping my arms around and giving all of my wonderful neighboring merchant groups a big hug. Um, as the uh, Mission Merchants Association, we're kind of a huge tent. Um, we span the entire mission and have um, one of the oldest, um, over 100 year old Mission Merchants mm -hmm. Association or Merchants Association in San Francisco. Um, we are a representation of many, many small businesses in this ever evolving neighborhood um, with the Latino roots. Um, we have old score taquerias, we have live music venues, chef driven eateries, craft cocktails, anything from tattoo parlors to ice cream shops. And one of the most beautiful parks in the city, um, Mission Dolores Park. And um, a shout out again to the murals that you'll see in our neighborhood, um, highlighting the women's building, which is a, a gorgeous um, anchoring um, spot for tourism. 
and uh, just come walk down, walk on the streets. Um, and, you know, talking about and hearkening back to what everyone else was saying with Carnival and Dias de los Muertos and all of these wonderful things for people to do when, um, when you visit our neighborhood. And as Bosch pointed out, you can walk around and hit all these wonderful places, spend an afternoon, um, invite friends. So we just want to say, come on down and see, see us and, and meet us. Um, uh, talking about what I've been through a little bit, um, I own a Pilates studio. We are um, one of the first businesses to be shut down and the last to reopen. We've had to get really creative with all of the things that um, we do. Um, again, highlighting how important technology has been for our business. And we've moved and pivoted our classes to um, online platforms and then work um, with Park and Rec and have dance classes and uh, tons of vibrant things going on um, in the parks. So um, check out your parks in your local neighborhoods too and see what's happening there. And uh, needless to say, it's been really a struggle. This last year for small business has been hard and we really look forward to reopening um, a lot of our peer business um, friends and neighbors have closed, um, but those that have held on tight are holding on and we will be here for you to service the neighborhoods. Um, one of the highlights is again, um, the parklets and then I'm gonna mention the closed streets and that we have a lot of weekend closures on the streets where people can go out and mingle with their neighbors and be safe with fresh air and cocktails and live music hitting the streets with the jamlets. And then um, also if you are visiting the corridors, I would highly recommend looking out on the side streets. We've got the Right Spot, which is a wonderful music venue that's been around for um, quite some time. And then um, grab some wine at the Royal Cuckoo Market and some cheeses and walk on over to the park. Um, we have a ton of vibrancy and rebirth happening in the mission and um, seeing some very exciting things going on with keeping us all together. Um, I wanna harken back to a little bit of the theme today is about technology and what we are doing in the Mission Merchants Association is coming up with a big rebrand. We're going to invest a lot of in our infrastructure to um, develop app technology to keep local businesses together and communicating um, a safety network and other things that we can do to help keep our citizens of San Francisco and our business community together. Um, we are all a part of the neighborhood and um, just want to say thank you and invite everybody down to see us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. So um, as you can see from our panelists, uh, times are tough and challenging. Uh, merchants are being compelled to rethink their business plans and adopt new technologies and efficiencies um, from creating online shops to expanding their social media, growing, keeping and growing their communities. Um, but we are very fortunate to be in San Francisco where our business environment is very collaborative as you can see from our panelists today. And the startup culture is really part of our DNA. Um, and as Gwen said, our symbol is the Phoenix. And you can see from our panelists, we are coming back in some shape or form. <laughs> so let's, let's get to some of these questions now, okay? Cause uh, we're running a little bit late. Um, let's start here. Okay. Um, Kenny, can you see some of the questions? Um, I'm actually, get, I just got a text from one of the panelists. I mean, the attendees. Um, so we have many transportation deserts in San Francisco, surprisingly, and especially now with upcoming uh, MTA budget cuts. How can crews help? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I wanna start by saying, I never wanna present crews as the one-stop solution to any of the challenges that we talk about, whether it's accessibility, equity, road safety, et cetera. I like to make sure that folks are clear. We see ourselves as a tool in the toolbox. Um, so to that end, understanding the impacts of COVID and the reduction in transit lines um, because of it. I think one of the ways that crews could help support is by um, creating, uh, again, an alternative service to get people from point A to point B and maybe even serve as that first mile, last mile option to get folks to these public transportation hubs. Um, so there's several different ways to do that. And to your point of the transportation desert specifically, um, one of the reasons why we feel like we're uniquely positioned to help address that is because we own and operate our entire fleet or will own and operate our entire fleet when we are, um, you know, when we launch the commercial service, which in short means we have the ability to make sure that we're servicing different neighborhoods in an equitable fashion 
um, by making sure that our, you know, if certain neighborhoods are like, hey, we noticed that we need more vehicles in the area at this time to help people get to and from work, to and from school, whatever the case may be. Um, these are things that we can address and also we'll be able to monitor patterns over time as to where we're seeing more requests coming in, things of that nature. So we have a little more flexibility, um, again, in ensuring that our vehicles can provide an equitable service. Awesome, thank you. And uh, one final question, as uh, businesses evolve and pivot during this period, how do you see crews fitting into this new, you know, new world that we're in? Yeah, uh, again, similar answer, right? I, I don't want to pretend that we are the answer to all things. And I always welcome mm -hmm. any and all feedback, uh, not just from the panelists, but attendees, anyone in San Francisco that wants to connect, please, I'm more than happy to. Um, but, you know, I think the sort of obvious response there is the delivery option, right? As we've seen through our partnership with the food banks, um, it's not a question of if it works, it's just a matter of how do we make it work for you and your business specifically. Um, so thinking through how we can provide just an alternative service to you know, provide a more affordable option for folks, um, that's one way. I think the other thing is thinking through transportation deserts, right? It's, it's a real challenge. So how can we help connect the city in a way that brings more foot traffic to your local businesses um, by providing access to folks that previously didn't have it for whatever reason. Um, so those are two of the top ways, but again, you all are so like well-versed in understanding of your own businesses that if you have ideas, I'm all ears. So always welcome and encourage the, the discussion and dialogue. Awesome. Well, listen, we need to wrap this up. We're going a little bit over schedule, but I wanna thank our amazing panelists. I wanna thank our attendees for taking time out to listen because this is an amazing district. It begs to be discovered. There's legacy businesses, new businesses, all the time coming into this area. And um, it looks like we're going into some great weather. Um, and it's always sunny in the mission, by the way. But anyway, it's even better this, this weekend. So please go out, enjoy the di districts. Literally, you can walk from one neighborhood to the other and enjoy the nuances, the differences, the cultures in these areas. And uh, cocktails at Cuckoo's tonight. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> Uh, Viva District 9. <laughs>